Hey, good morning, everyone. It's Wednesday, time for our few minutes together. We call it Coffee with PC. I've got my cup of coffee. I actually got a new cup today, unique cup. Just got this as a gift. Uh, Miss Nora gave me this along with a desk set that this sits on. And here's the cool thing. It's got a special kind of cup and bottom that interacts with that as a warmer. So I can put this cup of coffee on that warmer and the coffee stays hot. Love a hot cup of coffee. Don't like that lukewarm after it sits for a few minutes. So this can sit on that warmer and as it sits there, keep it hot so I can sip on it as long as I want and it's hot the whole way. I don't have to drink it too fast. The cool thing is also it, that same desktop set has a wireless phone charger. So I get the coffee to charge the preacher and the phone charger to charge the communication device and I am good to go. So thanks to Miss Nora. She, she said 22 years of of uh, being here, being her pastor, and so that was a cool, neat gift, uh, an encouragement to me um, in this last week or two that was received, so thanks to her for that. Wanted to spend a few minutes with you as we are in Holy Week. It's Wednesday of Holy Week. Looked it up, not that familiar, as I said on Sunday with all the traditions of Holy Week, but I found out that Holy Week Wednesday is called one of two things. Some people have called it Silent Wednesday, and that's because there's not really a traditional thing that Jesus does on Wednesday. It seems to be a quiet Wednesday for him. Maybe he stays in Bethany with uh, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, who he was staying with there and doesn't come into Jerusalem, doesn't have any of the confrontations or, or any of the things that happen on the other days of the week. It's also called Spy Wednesday, and that's because uh, traditionally it's thought to be the day that Judas makes his way into Jerusalem to make his deal with the religious leaders to betray Jesus. So in essence, becoming a spy on the, the Messiah, on the Savior. And so, so I thought I'd spend a few minutes thinking about, about Judas and talking about Judas with you. We, we don't typically talk about him. As I've said in other contexts, if you were making a list of disciple rankings, Judas would be absolutely on the bottom. Um, scripture would record that for a variety of reasons. Certainly the fact that he betrayed him, but he's also called a devil from the beginning. So, so obviously not um, one that would continue the work after Jesus' death and resurrection and be a pillar of the early church, took his own life after this episode of uh, the betrayal there. Um, but, but what led to that betrayal is kind of the thing, because, because here's the reality of Judas. He was on the inside. He was one of those who traveled with Jesus. He had an up-close front row seat to the teaching of Jesus, to watching Jesus perform all of the miracles from healing the blind, the lame, uh, the lepers, to even raising the dead, like Lazarus, whose house they were staying in. Uh, you know, Jesus, he, he was there for it all. He saw it all, and, and he actually had a, a, a particular role among the disciples, and that's really what brings us to today's uh, meditation on today's scripture passage, John chapter 12, we learn this kind of little side detail about him that Judas kept uh, the money back for the disciples. Obviously, in that day, just like in ours, uh, they needed funds to do the things that they did, to travel, to buy food, to, to do whatever it was, and so Judas was the one entrusted with that. And we learn that in connection with a particular story. Probably did not happen on Wednesday. In fact, it says it's six days before the Passover, so definitely not Wednesday, but many think this is the final straw for Judas that pushed him toward the actions where he would go and, and arrange to betray Jesus. John 12 and some of the other Gospels tell the same account where Jesus is in Bethany, which is where he stayed during the Passover, and, and he's at a dinner given in his honor, and into that dinner comes a woman with a very expensive jar of perfume. She takes the perfume, she opens it, she, she pours it on Jesus' feet, wipes his feet with her hair, and it says the whole house, John says in John chapter 12, verse 3, is filled with the aroma of this perfume. It's, it's this, uh, this very intimate, beautiful moment of, of her worship and her, her humility and her thanks, we might even say, toward Jesus. But, but we get this insight into Judas's view of the events because John says in verse 4, but one of his disciples, namely Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, in case you missed that little detail, he objected. He objected to this woman doing this extravagant act for Jesus. He says, why wasn't this perfume sold 
and the money given to the poor. It's worth a year's wages. Now, now that might seem like a very good point that he makes, that, that this act seemed wasteful. Of course, Jesus commends her for it and says that, that um, it, it's something that should have been done, that, that, sh that rather than save it, she anointed him for his burial because obviously his burial was rushed and not properly uh, prepared for. But nonetheless, Jesus rebukes Judas, but Judas has this great point. Why, why didn't we use the money to, to help the poor? And, and, and that sounds really good, doesn't it? I mean, I mean that's the, we might say that's the right answer. So like saying Jesus at church or Jesus in Sunday school, it's always the right answer. We might say, hey, look, Judas got the right answer. He's saying the right things. He's been in the right company. He's been with Jesus just like the other disciples throughout all of this time. That, that there's something about Jesus that he was attracted to and was willing to give up his life to follow him and, and to learn from him. You know, would have, we might think, uh, a prime seat of, of position, power, honor, authority when Jesus asserted himself as Messiah. In fact, we see some of the other disciples actually arguing about that. Who will be greatest in your kingdom? Uh, Judas might have been thought to be kind of among that select group who had a shot at being way up in the list of, of celebrities or authorities in the later kingdom to come. Uh, but, but we also learn here, the next verse, which I haven't read yet, that, that what Judas said, what, what his words, which sounded good and godly and spiritual, were really empty because they betrayed his true motivation. Notice John goes on and says in John 12, verse 6, he did not say this because he cared about the poor. So, sounds good, but his motivations were didn't. He said it because he was a thief, and as keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. So we get this little detail John gives us about Judas. Uh, it's, he's the only one that mentions this. He, others mention the objection, but John calls specifically out Judas as the key objector to this moment and, and tells us a little bit about his character, tells us a little bit about what's going on behind the scenes. You see, I think Judas, like many in that day, had a choice to make when Jesus failed to meet their expectations. Uh, I, I think about even in this last week of his life, the expectations that Jesus stoked. By his entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, he recalled a couple of hundred years before a great revolt that happened um, by Judas Maccabees. It's recorded in the Apocrypha, those books of Maccabees, that, that there was a, a desecration of the temple by the Seleucid dynasty. Antiochus, Antiochus Epiphanes uh, sacrifices a pig, basically, in, in the temple, and the Maccabees lead the revolt to overthrow the Seleucids and gain back the temple uh, and, and Jerusalem for, for the people. And at the end of that, Judas rides into Jerusalem on a donkey, and they wave palm branches, and palm branches particularly become a symbol because he has palm branches stamped on coins of the area as a memento to commemorate this victory in their history. Um, so people riding, or a, a, a conquering king riding into Jerusalem waving palm branches, this, this has a lot of recent history even for the people stirring up their thoughts that Jesus was coming to do something incredible for them, to deliberate them, just like Maccabees did a few generations earlier. Uh, and so Jesus has these expectations where the people are saying, Hosanna, save us, son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord only to just a few days later. We talked about this kind of on Sunday to change their, their, their tone and, and to instead cry, crucify him. Uh, Judas, we can see he has that change maybe in his mind too, that, that though he is happy to follow Jesus when it looks like he, he's riding high when it looks like everything's going his way. And let's not forget when it's personally benefiting him because he's keeping his hand in that money bag. Uh, he, he's fine with Jesus. Jesus is great. But when it starts to cost him something, Judas comes to a point where he feels like he's had enough, that Jesus isn't doing for him what he wants. And so he Maybe we'd say take matters into his own hands. Some people have speculated maybe he betrayed Jesus because he wanted to push him 
to, to asserting his dominance. He, he wanted to, to, to help speed along the process of, of Jesus taking his rightful place. I'm not sure if that is true or not, but it's some, what some speculate. We do know, based on what John tells us, that what Judas did was certainly out of selfish motives. And it was ultimately out of Jesus doing something he didn't like that didn't meet his expectations. And so it led him to take this action. Now, I know we don't often like to compare ourselves to Judas, but, but it's a worthwhile thing, particularly on this middle of the week, this Wednesday of Holy Week, this Spy Wednesday, to consider how do we react? when Jesus doesn't meet our expectations? How do we respond when, when Jesus doesn't do what we want? Or specifically, like Judas, when Jesus doesn't do something that ultimately might benefit us? See, what Jesus would do, and what we'll celebrate this weekend on Good Friday and Easter Sunday, is, is provide for our salvation by his death on the cross, providing forgiveness, by his resurrection, securing our salvation. But it wasn't up to what Judas expected, and so he turned on him. What do we do? How do we react in our lives when Jesus doesn't do what we expect, doesn't do what we hope benefits us? Hopefully, it's not a Judas-like response, but it's worth considering. It's worth asking ourselves how we would respond. In fact, I'm going to lead us in a word of prayer if I can, um, just to ask God to to, to check our hearts. Why do we follow Jesus? Was Judas just following Jesus when there was something in it for him? Or was he following Jesus for better reasons, for who Jesus was? Let's pray and ask God to show us our own motives this holy week. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the, the witness of your scriptures. And we thank you that, that as James called them, they're like a mirror that we can look into. And, and Lord, as much as we look into them, they look into us that your word is sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing and even judging the thoughts and attitudes of our hearts. So Lord, today on this holy week, as we prepare to worship around your death and resurrection, may we ask ourselves, what are our motives for following you? And how do we respond when you don't always meet our expectations? Do we recognize you for who you are? and desire to follow you because we've seen your love demonstrated by your death and resurrection? Or are we just in it as long as it benefits us? Father, convict us where we need. And in this Holy Week, may we become more like you. May we become holy as we consider your goodness and your grace and your sacrifice. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, real quick, just a quick rundown on our Easter weekend. Good Friday, 7 p.m., in-person only, no streaming, Good Friday communion service. Love to have you join us. And then Easter Sunday, we will stream only our Easter sunrise service. We actually have some baptisms we'll be doing right as the sun comes up behind us. Uh, so we invite you to worship with us as we look at the account in the gospel of the resurrection of Jesus. 7 a.m. streaming on our Facebook page, just our Facebook page. That's the easiest way to get it out. Um, First Baptist Key Largo on Facebook. And then Sunday morning, our main Easter worship service is 9 o'clock. That's in person right here in our church, or we'll, we'll stream it like we usually do. Um, love to have you be a part of all of these uh these different services. Um, we would ask if you're planning to come in person Easter Sunday at 9 a.m. If you would register, I'll put the link on, on this video so you can click it and tell us you're going to be here in person. But other than that, we, we hope you can connect with us this Easter weekend as we remember the death of Jesus on Good Friday and celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, that centerpiece of the gospel message that provides for our salvation. I'm looking forward to worshiping with you in all of these ways as we Thank God for what he has done that we were powerless to do for ourselves, but that he did for us out of his great love and grace on our behalf. Take care. Hope you can join us Friday or Sunday as we worship together.